I'm Mithali Banerjee. I'm a professor in the strategy group at ATC Paris. I finished my PhD from Columbia University in New York. Um, so I study uh, the relationship between human capital, especially novelty, and various forms of social capital, uh, fame, social networks, reputation, often in creative markets, uh, such as the modern art market, the jazz industry, and now more recently in the MBA labor market and executive search market. This paper came out of my dissertation and what it tries to answer what is a very simple question uh, or a seemingly simple question, what is the relationship between novelty and fame of innovators? Um, it turns out that there are a host of theoretical and empirical challenges that need to be addressed to answer this question. Um, and I think Part of it is there has been this tension between novelty can be very helpful, it's very valued, particularly in creative industries, but we all know that there are risks associated with novelty. There's hard to understand, novel products can be disruptive. Um, and we try to answer that question by looking not just at the product level, which is what most of the research has looked at, but at the producer level and so at the producer level, we look at all the work that um, an innovator has created till a given point in time and try to look at what is sort of, in, first of all, just the average novelty of the person. Then what is the most novel of their works and what is sort of the range in a novelty. And these sort of are meaningful sort of conceptual aspects of a producer's work because as much as the average matters, so does what, how does your most novel work matters. And if you think of academics, we are not evaluated by one work, we are evaluated by the body of our work. The same thing goes when you talk, look at sort of any critical review of any artwork or a movie or a book, they are not being evaluated on the basis of that work. Even as a new movie is written about, inevitably, the writer is referencing all the other work that this person has created, all the work that the sort of their peers have created. So in that sense, there is always that comparison. And these features, the mean, the average, the peak, the variability is in some sense to capture that aspect of the producer's corpus. But with it comes the challenge of having a large scale measure of novelty. And in order to do that, uh, so there has been some prior work, uh, for instance, going back to Simonton's work in music, where he looked at the first six notes or seven notes of a score. And in that, in some sense, that is, was, he was limited by what was being, what were the tools at the time. But that's in some sense, I, as I will argue in my presentation, that there are serious limitations to that measure. More recent works have, like Brian Utzi's work has looked at, um, in some sense, the novelty in the source, the bibliography of a paper. But again, in that sense, you're kind of making the assumption that the novelty of a product can be reduced to the novelty of its sources. So this was, in some sense, trying to address, build on both these uh, the li prior work and also come look at the novelty of a complex product. And we use these new tools with machine learning. In this case, it's a neural net. And it allows us, in some sense, a large, very large scale measure. Uh, a very important part of this, using this method, has been to also make sure that it has some relationship to what we already know. So the best measure we know so far is expert evaluation. And this paper sort of presents both validation of the computational measure and both with the expert measure and also just by looking at what we highlight specific works that show us that actually our measure of novelty is capturing uh, the novelty of these works. That's a really a great question. Fame is different from reputation. It is different from status uh, in that it's 
Conceptually, it is the amount of attention you're getting. And there has been some, not a whole lot of work, actually within sociology where it's, they, it's just this attention in the broader culture. And what's important is that unlike reputation, unlike status, fame is, can be positive, negative, neutral. And within a certain range, all that attention is actually very valuable. It is valuable for innovators, for scientists, for artists, um, for politicians, for social activists, because that attention is in, first of all, that's how you enter the consideration set of any kind of evaluation or award you're going to get. Um, there is work done by From Byrne that suggests that the more attention you get, there is familiarity associated with it. Um, the most, I guess, stark example of that is in, the po in US politics. Just sheer attention matters a lot in getting um, access to resources. Uh, and as a performance measure, if you look at scientists, musicians, the famous scientists, the famous musicians, they are very much defining our understanding of what that category, what that genre, what that work means. Um, so in that sense, it's both a resource and it's also a very important performance measure. I think uh, that as we were talking, the traditional way cr creative industries have been understood is uh, often what we call cultural markets, for instance, modern art, cuisine, uh, fashion. And um, so first of all, what's, I think, if you ask anybody, these are multi-billion dollar industries to the extent that management and business cares about large industries. This is, these are all multi-billion dollar industries. Um, also, they are great contexts to understand in many ways the same problems that you see with technology. For instance, when a new technology, a new drug or a new medical procedure comes uh, in the market, there's a lot of subjectivity. There is a lot of contestation, whether this is valuable, how do we value, how does it gain legitimacy? And the same thing is true of modern art. Modern art, when it came on the market, there were lots of detractors, lots of critics, there were supporters. So how do these products gain attention? How do they gain le legitimacy? Uh, how do the producers uh, actually gain resources? So most of artists, restaurant owners, bakers, fashion designers, these are the quintessential entrepreneurs. So everything that an entrepreneur does, for instance, launching a tech firm or a traditional business firm, same processes. It's a business. Uh, there's a lot of risk and uncertainty involved. You have to rely on all kinds of social capital uh, to get uh, money, to get employees, uh, getting the word about your product, your ideas out there. The same challenges that artists, bakers, fashion designers face, any other business faces. So these are sort of I, I, it's hard for me to see in some sense why they are distinct um, and in some sense one would say you would the risks in is in some sense much higher because you're an artist you're in some sense not even considered a serious adult <laughs> in certain contexts because you're an artist uh, so there's a lot of social sort of evaluations devaluation of your work and how do you how do these entrepreneurs cope with that um, Picasso was a great business person. He was extremely savvy. He was extremely savvy about how he positioned himself. So I think these lessons apply to people looking at entrepreneurship, looking at the subjectivity of new innovations and how creativity and innovative products are valued. Um, so I think and for all these reasons, it's, these are very much part of business, a part of management. and. I hope that as there's more, as we are doing more and more work, people do see the parallels between the two, uh, and not something that is kind of 
a particular. Um, I think, in some sense, also in as I think I would say in certain cases, you want to understand individual level creativity, but getting measures of that, you can often it's like at the team level, you don't know who is contributing what. I mean, if you're studying software development, maybe you can. Uh, but in case of, for instance, paintings, these are amazing measures of individual level creativity. Uh, so if you want to empirically, neatly study that, I think they offer great opportunities for, uh, to do that. Um, so I hope people see that. I think people are seeing that more and more. Um, and I mean, it's all, I've always been surprised when creative industries has been considered something very distinct from management or business. Um, so. So, so the talent very much was uh, a producer's own creativity is evolving, but so is her peers. Our work is only novel if relative to what other people are doing in many ways. And that's why, again, you not only need to measure the creativity of one person, you need to measure her peer group. And also as that work is evolving, so basically you need this large scale measure. And that's why we, this measure allows us to kind of look at, we are comparing how the creativity is changing uh, so it's a dynamic measure. In, uh, we look at the creativity of an artist relative to a peer group in a 10-year window, and it's a moving 10-year window. As her peers' work evolve, so does hers, and we compute sort of the novelty relative to this moving window. So that, in some sense, is meant to address that, the reference group. Uh, we also did additional analysis relative to peers, uh, the producer's own work. So are you becoming more novel with respect to your own? So that was another the dimension that we try to address though it's not included in the paper I have not added that to reduce the complexity of the paper the the other question you asked was about what is valued in some sense there are all these trends fashion trends and fads blue and pink or red and pink is red and blue is valid, seen as novel at some point and not so that's hopefully going to be another paper where our goal is actually to look at what is sort of the prevailing art movement, the dominant art movement, and how are artists who are close to that dominant trend versus not uh, actually doing? Uh, does that actually help them? Uh, in some sense, one would expect if you're swimming against the tide, you are actually going, it's going to hurt. But it remains to be seen uh, in what respects, like swimming, it doesn't matter if you're swimming too far away from what's the dominant trend or you're swimming kind of with the trend. There is also the risk you're part, too much part of the herd. And um, so that's something that is going to be a separate paper. What was interesting is this is a separate case study that I have done, uh, which kind of we may or may not choose to integrate into the paper is there was this British artist, David Bomberg, who was um, considered one of the most pioneers of abstract art in Britain. Uh, Picasso, artists like Picasso praised his work. And then, so this was before World War I, he goes to fight in the First World War, there he loses his friends, um, and he kind of becomes very depressed. Uh, but then when he comes back, the British art market kind of changes. It becomes, actually moves away from the modern abstract paradigm back to being the more representational art. There's kind of a turning away. Mm -hmm. And there was, it is a shift broadly in Europe, but more, I think, acutely in Britain at the time. And so he kind of adapted to the market. He started painting landscape and portraits. Um, but here's the interesting thing. This artist who had such a great beginning became virtually obscure. It was not until 1980s that an art historian kind of rediscovered his work. Um, and sort of the goal of that case study that I did was to show that even though in many ways this artist is doing what is a rational adaptive response, one might say, and his reasons for doing it might be varied, 
he actually it hurts his career mm -hmm. and the argument is that he had an identity in the market of being this very radical abstract artist and he kind of deviates from that he loses that audience for that work and then he ends up competing which what is actually a very crowded uh, genre where it has lots of established figures so I think there are risks to swimming with the tide and especially if it's coming at the risk of kind of sharply deviating from your own trajectory but that's something that so many fields are face we as academics there is always some trend um, that you want to fit into because it helps you get published but there's also the risk that you're kind of deviating from uh, first of all it's going very far away from what you've already done is a lot of work. There is a capabilities uh, limitation, but there's also the identity that you are known for doing this. You're kind of betraying what the art, at least art historians call what David Bromberg was doing, betraying your audience, and then you're ending up competing in a very crowded space. So it remains to be seen. So I, I think that kind of has led to our, this interest in what does it mean when you're swimming with the tide or swimming against it. Uh, so I'll let you know. Oh, so in the other paper, which actually has the network data of uh, these um, modern art abstract artists, is the goal was to exactly look at is it social capital that is shaping the artist's fame, the structure of their networks, or and is it shaping it by basically making them more creative, helping them combine new ideas, what the, a lot of the literature has led us to believe, or is it doing it independent of the novelty or the creativity of the work? And um, again, there it was very important to have an objective measure of uh, creativity uh, of the act of the work because there's been considerable debate about whether the objective properties matter in for success in labor markets or is it it's a social it's a purely socially constructed market and that's what in many ways the other paper tries to do by using both combining social network data and objective measure of novelty and what we find much to our surprise is yes social structure does matter. Uh, artists who span very diverse social worlds, both in terms of the structural properties measured by brokerage and also the compositional properties. So artists who are part of this more cosmopolitan international milieu end up being more famous. But it's the mechanism is not because their work is more objectively creative. So objective creativity and also even subjective measures that we used with experts show that the link is not creativity. And rather, our, it is directly through the networks and our interpretation based on looking at the art historical discourse of the time is it is your social structure is shaping the perception of novelty rather than the actual novelty. So it's a much more socially constructed story. Um, so in that sense. So, but keep in mind, this is in some sense, I'm looking at the very pioneers of abstraction. Um, they were hardly, mo most of them were not famous, but most of them were very, very, in some sense, creative. And within that, what we are finding in that set is it's not their objective creativity, but it's actually the social capital, the social structure, which is shaping how people talk about their novelty. So if you look at the art historical discourse of the period, uh, there were the artists who were considered these true rebels who are breaking all the norms, they have no respect for tradition, and they're being trashed by a lot of art historians. Uh, Picasso was trashed by a lot of art historians, as were a lot of abstract artists and modern artists. But, uh, but you do see that there is this other audience that deeply values this kind of work that is completely breaking with the traditional representational paradigm that does not want to necessarily speak to tradition and preserving national heritage and is in some sense positioning itself as art for its art's sake and we need to break down all the barriers. And that is, I would say, a perception that's being shaped in part by 
mostly by, for artists who were part of this very cosmopolitan milieu. A lot of the very avant-garde artists were kind of, they lived in similar neighborhoods and very cosmopolitan, a lot of immigrants uh, coming together. So I think at least that's what the qualitative evidence is suggesting, it's that social structure is shaping a perception of their creativity in that. <laughs>